on the road. We snuck up on you in our electric F-150. We're visiting Mike Bernard Construction here in Bodega Bay, California. And I got with me CJ with CNC Electric, a super cool coaster house. We got a lot of wind going on. It's a beautiful day. Well, let's get going. All right, guys, let me introduce you to Mike Bernard, Bernard Construction. Uh, here in Bodega Bay. And then of course, you know, CJ with CNC Electric shooting videos over on Build Show Network. Uh, CJ, you're doing the wiring on this house or did already, right? Yep. You've been working with Mike for a while? A while, yeah. We've done a few homes together. And Mike, talk to me about this coastal house. I mean, it looks to me like we are not very far at all from the ocean on this project, are we? No, no, maybe a couple hundred feet at <laughs> best, yeah. So brutal condition, brutal. So, we got, yeah, the marine influences is rough. So we're talking wind, water, and salt, right? Correct. Oh, yeah. So much so that I saw in the house next door, it looked like there's a couple of rusty uh, things here and there on the yeah, outside of the house. Yes, if you don't do things correctly, you're gonna have a few issues, for sure. Now, this is not cedar on the outside of the house, though, is it? I thought it was maybe when I pulled up. Correct. It's uh, Boreal. It's uh, nickel gap siding. It's 100% uh, fly ash. Okay, so this is from Westlake Royal now, is the owner of this product. And it looks like a cedar 1x6. And this is a uh, shiplap profile, right? That you're in vertically. Here's a little sample of it. Am I looking at the right thing? Yes. And it looks like you ran it with the smooth side in, so you've got kind of the the textured side out. Textured Correct. side, yeah. Yeah, I like that. So uh, I guess you're not nailing on the blind, though. You're actually nailing no, where you can see the fasteners. Correct. Uh, the specifications are yeah to not blind nail and to, to expose the fasteners. So yes. And what are you using for nails on the outside here? I suspect you're worried about. Uh, those nails rusting on you, aren't you? Correct, correct. Yeah, that's that's a yeah. So these are stainless steel ring shank, uh, grade three sixteen. Yeah, stainless nails. And how does this compare to cedar in terms of cost or workability, longevity? Uh, its cost is is very similar to clear cedar. Mm -hmm. um, longevity. I mean, this is only my second project with it, but um, looking at the way it's constructed, I, I got to believe it's going to last nearly forever. Yeah, a long time. A long time. So um, pretty cost comparative to cedar about the same uh, price. Same same price as uh, clear cedar. Okay, clear so cedar. expensive. But you know you end up with a very similar finish. You you yeah. know still have both clear. I like so, that. Yeah. And is this jam also the same material for your garage here? It is. This is a two by ten, I believe, um, that was ripped down. And uh, yes, this is the same exact material. It comes up to I believe a two by twelve. I right. like that. CJ, when I walk into the garage, I'm noticing a couple of like weird double gang outlets on either side of the door. What are these bad boys? With big wires in them? With big wires? Uh, standard issue, it's a level two charger in California. So they require actually that we have a 50 amp circuit by code or a one inch empty conduit going back to the load center. Both will comply with code, That'll but most of our clients are gonna want a charger yeah. so these are getting them you know from right out of the box and is that copper or aluminum in there? copper 6.3 so we're running 50 amps with a level 2 charger we'll give you a 40 amp charge that's an expensive piece of wire in there too isn't it you know and, and copper yeah and big, it's thick only conductor. gone up it's only gone up <laughs> and what you'll run that back to a 220 30 amp 220 50 50 so okay. 50 amp circuit um, a lot of the vehicles are actually coming with a NEMA 1450 four wire um, or in this case, you know, the Ford charger, Tesla charger, we can hook right onto these without plugging in. Ideally, we're avoiding a plug connection if we can okay. and going straight hardwire, but it just depends on the charger. Gotcha. And is that your first electric vehicle, by the way, your F-150, Mike? No, second. Second. How do you like it so far as a builder? Excellent. Excellent. Love it's it. worked well for you? Quite well. And do most of your clients pre-wire for this, like CJ did on this one, or are you guys putting conduit in sometimes? No, um, it's actually required. It's a code requirement to be prepped for at least one car charger. Okay, so. at least one you have to. Yeah, at least one. In this case, we did two, because they're gonna have two vehicles, but um, we again, we have to at least prep for it. Gotcha. And I'm seeing a giant gutter on the ceiling over here with a bunch of very thick aluminum wires. What am I seeing over <clears> there? So power outages, common, but also battery backups are a real common one. Oh, is so that right? this house out of the box will have um, a Tesla gateway ah. and inverter. So what we're doing is pre-wiring our load center and we have every load in the house backed up. 
that's going to be in this load center. Anything that we don't want backed up, and I think in this house it might only be a hot tub that we're not backing up, hmm. is pulled out of the main. So non-protected loads will come out of the main, and then all protected loads will come out of the sub panel. Holy cow. And so the power outage, transfer switch closes, backs up this, and it'll run on batteries. And we have prep for batteries um, on the wall behind us. Wow. Have you done a bunch of those, Mike? No, not, not a lot. Not no. yet. Okay. okay. So it's not like it's an everyday occurrence here no, in California. No, it's in less three to four years, this has become more of a thing for sure. And the technology is catching up, so more affordable. Yeah. That load center looks really tall. What size you is wanna that see? thing? You want to see? What is that? It's a 60120. So oh 60 full gosh. size breakers or uh, 120 slims. So we just run these instead of running 240 load centers, uh, 240 space load centers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in a house this size, I think we're at like 30, 500 square feet, yep. three bedrooms. I mean, it's really easy to fill up a 40 space load center for us. I mean, we dedicate galore, but again, it's just a few extra spaces. That's really nice. I like how you label these too. Oh uh, yeah, I love They're, it. They label everything. It they makes really my do, life very they? easy. That's nice. It saves a lot of questions. Very cool. Let's go inside. I wanted to show these guys uh, some of your modern trim details. I'll meet y'all in there. Man, we got some nice looking uh, modern details over here, Mike. It's not often in the drywall phase that you see door jams in place already. I'm assuming this is because this is a trimless detail. Correct, right. And so how are you doing this? You're installing jams during the framing stage, right? Before sheetrock gets installed? Correct, and I'm not crazy about it either. It's, it's, it's a tough <laughs> detail, but um, it's a great look. But yeah. yeah, you're correct. In the very early on, as the framing finishes, we have to install these jams uh -huh. and prep them. They have a kerf in them to accept the drywall metal. And then more importantly, we have to nail it right here so that the wood flooring slides under there perfectly because oh, there is no it. adjustment here. So oh, yeah. we have to be very careful. So in other words, your trim carpenter has a piece of three quarter flooring uh, sample that he's dropping this on. And are your finished carpenters or the drywall guys putting this corner bead on? Uh, the drywall guys are putting this on, but in terms of the spacer and the jam and so forth of the carpenters, but yeah, the critical is here. We gave them a spacer block that they use to keep this up a perfect distance to allow that wood flooring to slide right under there. And then later the wood flooring guys can cut this with a jam saw probably. Or a Correct, tool. around here, but they yeah. cannot cut that metal. So that metal's got to be set. It's got to be. Just right. Yes, perfect. There is no forgiveness. Do you have one of these in process that maybe doesn't have the mud on yet that we can see? Yes, I have one upstairs we can take a look at. Let's go upstairs. There's not a square corner in this whole house, is there, Mike? No, not a single one. Pretty contemporary, interesting design. I like it. Man, look at this view. Before, before I show that detail, look at this view, guys. <laughs> wow. I mean, the ocean is right there. This is pretty terrific. What a cool custom home. Okay, but this is the detail we were talking about. Now, this isn't a door. This is a, well, actually, this is a sliding glass door, maybe. But not a kerf, but interesting trimless. So we've got a corner bead going on here. You've got a tearaway bead. This looks to be like a uh, Trimtex tearaway, tearaway Correct. bead. Correct. And that's been stapled on. And then your guys come in with a fiberglass tape and then they mud that all in. That's correct. And then when it's all done, which is a nice little detail, is this tearaway is torn, when it's torn off, mm -hmm. there's about a 16th to an eighth inch little shadow line because inevitably that's always a rough detail how the drywall finishes up against the frame and this just leaves a nice little reveal there. So whenever we have a condition like this, we use tearaway. So if like we have an exposed that. beam, we would run this around or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice little detail. Yeah. And the same issue at the bottom too, keeping it up off the floor, allow the flooring to come underneath. I like that. I also like that your carpenters look like added some blue tape on there as a double safety. That was pretty smart. Yes. That's a good yes. call. Yes. Now let's look at a jam on the door. So here's a door right here. So now we can see you've got the kerf cut in your jam and you've got, I don't know, maybe three eighths or so of wood in that jam before the kerf. And then this looks like just a standard metal corner beam, is, is that right? It is just a standard metal corner beam. That's correct. Just slides into the kerf there. And uh, yeah, fiberglass tape. That's you know what's it. cool about this, Mike, is it, there's nothing fabulously expensive. It's just a sequencing That's detail, right? Right. right. And, and the risk of uh, damage. To right. These. So when, when all this is done, uh, the drywall is done, then these will all be covered and protected. 
but until that moment, they're, this, they're at risk. They're at risk, yeah. But these are gonna be painted, I'm assuming, right? This is not a stain yeah. grade. Yeah. And I'm also noticing that these are not your final doors. These are just some dunnage doors. doors. Correct, those are, those are temp doors, so we get the proper weight and size so that we can hang and get these set properly. Because the, the, the part I have not brought up yet is, once these are set, there, there's no adjustment. It's just much as at the bottom, there's no adjustment. There's no adjustment. So if these are not set properly or they're not square or they're out of plumb or there may be a whoop in them. There's no fixing it yeah, other right than tearing it out. out. So yeah. that's why we use temporary doors and uh, get them set properly. Thanks, great, Mike. Well done, sir. Let's go check out the kitchen. Uh, CJ, talk to me about the lighting that we're seeing here. Are these just standard trim rings that you'll put on at the final stage? So just like Mike has all these other details that are mud flash or trimless, we're doing the same thing on the recess cans. Ooh. And so what we have is actually a standard Nora four inch aperture. Okay. But what I like about these Noras is that you're not married to a housing before you decide if you want to go trimless. Oh, Most really? of the times you're trimless, you got to have the right housing in place before drywall. Yep. And so in this application, we're able to use the, tri the same housing uh, that will accept the normal flange recess or if you opt to go trimless, which isn't too much more expensive, all you're doing is buying a ring. And so I got a couple. Ooh, cool. And so really all it is, is this. Check so it out. So if you decide to go trimless, I'll pop it open for you. We're literally just screwing this up and it's got a drywall flange around it. Uh -huh. It accepts four screws and we'll put a couple extra in for nail pops. And then this pops out after, and then that's gonna be the actual aperture of the recess. How so about that? same lumen output, but what they're calling these instead of mud flush is trimless. Trimless. So mud flush will allow a normal flange trim to sit flush, but this is actually trimless. So it's really a nice finish. Same lumen output, same same cam, hmm. just a lot smaller. And, w and any rough idea on what these things cost? Uh, I always do, it's about 50 bucks for the housing, okay. 50 bucks for the trim, and then when you're going trim list, you're adding about 15 to $25, depending on. Um, so those are the round apertures. And another Not thing terrible. that I really like is normally when you're going uh, round or square, Ooh. you have to know before you actually install the recess. Most manufacturers, when you're going square, you have to choose huh. a square housing before you go square. In this application, we could decide now. We could ask the customer, you want to go square or you want to go round? How about that? Pretty neat. Now, if I were the electrician, I would be praying that they chose round, personally. <laughs> In this house, round's the case because we have so many tapered There's rooms. The square so corners anywhere. So the, the laser, or the, uh, the square requires us to lay out so many times. So when we're going square, we're not only lasering the housings on rough, we're lasering the trims oh my and then we're lasering again during final install but that's pretty you know, wild you gotta, you gotta be square or you're gonna see it and when will you guys come back to put these on or is this something that mike's guys will put on nope so that's us and it's actually happening tomorrow so you can see we're mid tape ah. we could have done it before they started um and they just happen to be scheduled tomorrow so what we'll do is come in with a box of 131 i think is in this house and they'll come through and they'll install each one, making sure that we will shoot a laser because you have a little wiggle room this way. But other than that, we'll be in here for a few hours and then drywall guys take it from there. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's really like awesome. It. Now we were talking earlier about a trick that you and Mike came up with, CJ, for uh, kind of getting an outlet into a rough spot. Talk to me about that. So in almost all of these homes, obviously the view is insane, mm -hmm. window heavy. So we got windows everywhere. And in this application, center of this wall is a sink. Okay, so we got sinks three... right here in the center of this yep. triple bank of windows. And so the challenge is, you know, design wise, the countertop's flowing right into the window. So we mm -hmm. have no backsplash. We're 36 inch countertop finish, and it actually finishes flush out with this. Okay. And so, Per code, we need a receptacle within 24 inches of the edge of the sink. So within 24 inches of the edge of the sink, you gotta have an outlet, but there's no outlet to be seen here. Nothing, we got no wall space. <laughs> but we got a good idea. 
Uh, Mike came up with this one. We actually have a solid post here. We approve with structural. We didn't go in very far. We got an inch and a half box, which will accept a normal device. Oh, a shallow box. Yeah, and <clears throat> if you keep one wire in it, you got plenty of room for your device. So mm -hmm. we're gonna just have a nice Lutron receptacle in there. And it got um, mortised out and we recessed that box in an inch. It sticks out a half inch. They'll trim this just like a normal window. And when, you're looking when in this it, case you it gets see. stone, this will be stone. Oh, oh stone. This is yeah. all here. Stone to the ceiling. So it's all be stone. Stone. Yep. And how awesome. I mean, wrapped in stone, and we'll have a nice receptacle on the side of this. Functional. I mean, there are other ways to go about it. You could go pop up. Mm -hmm. They're a pain. They're not very useful. You're having to push it. They're yeah. hard to clean. This is actually a functional receptacle, and I love it, it looks good. Yeah, you can just pop your crock pot right yep. in there. And so all we did is angle drill into the wall cavity before framing just like a normal, you know, routing and we got in. So Makes we got sense. one on each side. It's really kind of a neat detail. I like that. Hey Mike, before we get out of the kitchen, I want to mention it looks like you've got a pantry space with a pocket door in here. Is this cavity slider? Yes. yes. Oh man, I like these. Yeah. I've got these in my yeah, house. The soft close. Yeah. Oh, is this the soft close yeah. unit too? Yep. Did yep. you just do a dunnage door to make sure that the spacing we did. and everything we, worked? So we had to preset uh, the cam inside of here so that it was, so as it opens, it's preset for perfectly for a three quarter inch piece of trim to be accepted on top of here. So this will flush out perfectly. Ah, and then to also it. get the cam proper. So for the soft close portion. So Smart. it's set just right. I like that. That's really cool. Anything that we miss from a builder's perspective on those, uh, on those trimless? Yes, trimless, one, that right? yeah, yes trimless. Um, I think as, as CJ mentioned, a hidden cost is, is for the drywaller. Um, it's a hundred dollars per can to float out each light. Wow. So that adds up. We have 130 cans, I believe. So there's $13,000. So there and I'm assuming that's because they end up basically solid floating these ceilings. Correct. They almost, because they're really trying to make sure that there's no issues. And are you normally doing a level four or a level five on your houses? Uh, it's a, it's a level five, but this particular home, it's, it's called a cottage texture, imperfect smooth. Some people call it, mm. but it's very close and similar to a smooth wall, but it just has minor imperfections. Okay. But then they're basically floating from but can to can to try to get that all totally. They are floating flush. from can to can. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. CJ, I wanted to uh, have you tell these guys about a really cool way to hide your uh, recessed, or actually I should, wait, should say to recess your bathroom exhaust. Would you show us that downstairs? Yep. Let's go check it out. Let me meet you down there. All right, check this one out, Matt. I don't know if you've seen, I know you've seen, but have you seen them in the flesh? I haven't. So this is an Aria vent, and that looks like just a standard Panasonic exhaust fan, right? Yep. So now, it, now what, why is it recessed back up there? <clears throat> so these are mud flesh. So just like we did with the recessed lights and the door trims and stuff, they wanted a sleek look. Huh. So this comes in a box like this. Yeah, which isn't you know too bad. They're definitely heavy duty. It's a lot thicker when I first opened these. They definitely may come out of a really decent um, steel. Um, but you can see it's got the flange like you'd see on any drywall trim. So this is going to get drywalled up to there. Yep, and all you're going to see is this flat panel, huh. right? But and it then pops. it turn, it turns the kind of ugly plastic grill into just a line, basically. Your, huh? your grill will hide behind this access panel. Oh, that's pretty so you sweet. Can see, that's what we're looking at right here. Okay. And that's up there. So how did you <clears throat> get that pre ready to go for this? Well, it was a little bit of a challenge. Me and Mike went back and forth on, you know, how we were going to do this. And Aria gives you a, an instruction sheet that's for a retrofit. Okay. So essentially, the directions say rough in or drywall cut your square out and then slide your your trim up and then slide the fan through the trim and then how are you going to hook all the ducting up all right. so what we decided to do was <clears throat> we took into consideration the drywall thickness okay which is five eighths uh -huh. and then there's a this is exactly an inch and five eighths okay so we spaced our fan housings up and put them in before drywall an inch so we literally just pushed them up in the wall cavity like we would normally except being flush, we're an inch back behind okay. finish framing. And then <clears throat> to expose these perfectly, um, the carpenters on site built us some of these foam. It's just rigid foam, but it's oh. an inch and a half. 
and it's the exact dimension oh, of this. How about that? That's awesome. And then we literally just tape these up to the Panasonic fan, the face of the fan. Uh -huh. And so when the drywall crew comes in, they literally drywall right to our foam. The foam. And then after drywall, right before this got put up there, we yanked these bad boys out and we have a perfect hole to put this in to put our event in so minus the uh minus this uh cover plate right yeah so we keep the cover plate off um see how it pops out with these little retention okay types? cool we keep these off and we stash them away nice in a box so they don't get dinged up and i'm banging it in like i am right now Got it. but you know it's just a piece of sheet metal they can get textured they can get color matched yeah and painted in this case whatever. we're going level five smooth wall so it's going to match perfectly and then those get put in when we trim out and before paint but essentially, this is all you're going to see right there. That's so pretty a awesome. Example. Way to go. I like that. That's pretty cool. Check this out, CJ. Mike's a smart builder. It took me a second to realize why he had a different colored sheetrock here than the rest of the room. This isn't sheetrock. This is cement backer board. Wall-hung toilet, right? Yep. When you put those wall-hung toilets on, they want a solid backer, like a tile backer uh, or you know some other type of solid backing. And I suspect that this wall is going to be just a smooth sheetrock wall, no tile. So what he did was he put cement board up prior to the sheetrock guys coming. They'll sheetrock to it. They'll float all this. When the toilet gets hung, it's got a nice solid backer for this floating toilet. That's a smart builder right there. It's a good detail. And he thinks about those things. One thing I want to point out too, that I think at least in walkthroughs is a misconception on some of these toilets. These are actually the Toto washlets. Mm -hmm. So they have an automatic lid, but they oh, also yeah. have um, hot water. Ah, so you so need it's a bidet. power for those, don't you? need you? power, and most people will just say, like, oh, we'll think about it. But we're actually re not required, but you have to install a dedicated circuit for these. So these uh -huh. actually, if you read the specs on them, are around 1,400 watts. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because they're bringing the water temperature up from you know wherever it comes into the house up to temperature quick. And it's instant, and so it's it's a it's a big load. So each one of these bathrooms actually has a dedicated circuit for each toilet. On you a know, G, on a dedicated GFI. On a dedicated too, right? GFI that says Toto Toilet, because <laughs> if you try to share it, and you got a you know a curling iron or you know even a toothbrush charging, pop you can pop those breakers. So dedicated circuit is absolutely crucial and often overlooked. That's pretty awesome. What a cool house. Let's go meet Mike and wrap up the video. All right. Mike, thank you so much for the tour, man. Bet what a cool bet. house. Guys, I'll put Mike's uh, website contact info down in the uh, description below if you're building Bodega Bay or remodeling too. You do a lot of remodels, it sounds like, with this harsh coastal climate that destroys houses pretty quick. Appreciate the tour, man. And CJ, always good to see your work, brother. I'm glad you got to stop by this one. It shows off a lot of the building science details, I think. Some really good details here, and it's awesome to work with a good builder like Mike. Yep, it means a lot. If you're not currently watching CJ's videos, he's shooting videos on a weekly basis over on buildshownetwork.com. And oh, by the way, I've been in California with CJ talking about his path to become an electrician. You know, we need more young people to make that decision to become a tradesman and woman out in the field for builders like Mike and I building houses. We need those houses built. So stay tuned in the future for our Talking Trade series. Won't be too long before you see that here. Uh, in the meantime, follow us on TikTok or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.